Well, a lot of people enjoyed learning about the CAN bus system, and so I did a recent project that I thought some of you might be interested in, and it had to do with Project Country Club and the CAN bus. Stick around. <music> Hey everybody, welcome back to the garage and excuse the heavy coat, it's freezing cold out here. I'm trying to stay warm, the garage is not that warm right now, so if you see me shiver a little bit, you'll know why. Nonetheless, I want to thank everybody for stopping by, thank all the new subscribers out there. If you have not hit the subscribe button, what do you have to lose? I mean, you're going to learn something eventually, or if you're not, you're going to bring something to the table that helps somebody else learn. That's the cool thing about this channel is we share information freely in between people who want to learn how to tune modify the cars, and things like that. So hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Make sure to check out the links. Tuning101.com brings you straight to this YouTube homepage. And then Goat Rope Garage goes to uh, GoatRopeGarage.com, goes to our homepage where you can get merch, uh, check out the Patreon, things like that. So make sure to check those links out if you have the time. Then, as always, hit up the comments down below. Share your information, share your stories, share your feedback, and, and just join the Goat Rope Garage community as a whole. So that being said, Project Country Club is running. We've got the Holly, uh, Holly Terminator, not Dominator. We didn't go backwards in time. We got the Terminator set up running. Uh, we've got the PCS 2000 transmission uh, controller running. That thing needs a little bit more tuning. It's not wanting to shift where I want it to quite yet. But I did take the car out yesterday and get it uh, registered finally. So the car is legal. I got to get through inspections yet, but that I got a little time to do that. That being said, though, I ran into an issue. We're still running the E67 ECU in there as a piggyback ECU for a couple things. And one of the big ones is the start circuit. This uses the C6 push button. It's a two-stage push button, just like it where you've got on, accessory, off. And basically, the switch is just a resistor on the top side and a different resistance on the bottom side. So the BCM looks at the resistance that it's getting, looks at the state of things like the engine, and it makes an informed decision on what the switch is trying to do. If it's the vehicle is completely off and you hit the bottom of it, it says, oh, hey, we want to go into accessory mode. If you hold the bottom of it, it says, hey, we want to go into uh, ignition on, engine off mode. Same ordeal if you're holding the brake and you hit the top side of it, it wants to start the car. It determines all this through those resistance levels in the state of the car, and it spits out a bunch of messages. But whenever we get into that, we're going to actually look at those messages because what we were having is with the E67, the communication between the BCM and the ECM was a little bit different, and so it wasn't wanting to shut off. The ignition relay was latching in, and that's controlled by a ground leg down on the ECM. It was not releasing that ground leg. That also happens to be the uh, crank run voltage source that we're using to power the Terminator X. Uh, because we need something that keeps power on it during the crank cycle so we can actually get fuel and spark delivery using an aftermarket ECM. But because of that, the car just wouldn't shut off. All the interior lights and stuff would shut off just fine, but as far as the car was concerned, the ECM was still on, the Terminator X was still on. So what was the easiest way of solving this while still retaining the E67? It was to go in, sniff out the CAN bus messages, and then to take a device, which we will get into here in a second, and use it to intercept that message and control a relay that now breaks that circuit leg to shut off ignition power, shuts off the factory ECM and the aftermarket ECM, problem solved. But it was a little bit more complicated than that. Let's jump over to the laptop. I'll pull up the information so you can see exactly what I'm talking about and we'll dive into the program that I wrote in order to do this. Okay, first let's talk about the device that we're using in this application. It's the Candy 7, developed by a couple guys out in Russia. Very smart guys, very good to work with. In fact, back a few years ago, whenever I was using this device to hack the Limbus network, I ran into an issue where the GM uh, Limbus was operating at a baud rate that wasn't supported by the device. I emailed them up. Within a couple hours, they had me a new firmware to flash in. And uh, it's about 100 bucks on eBay. That's how you get it. It takes a little while to get in. And they have a couple different models that you can choose from. Uh, but the one that I use is just the Canny 7. They got a Canny Duo that actually has two CAN channels on it. And then they have a scaled down, maybe it's called like the Canny 5, which is uh, doesn't have all the I.O. on. But as you can see, this one has, by default, uh, the CAN. And then it has like 10 I.O. channels, technically 11. Two of them can be used for limb bus instead of I.O. And the cool thing about it is, is this is in function block. If you have a PLC background, man, it's super easy. Function block is something that you're probably already familiar with. So the setup on it is real simple. And of course, the software is free. 
Uh, so I have used multiple of these, and in this situation, it worked great for me. You can also use this as a CAN bus sniffer. I still prefer the uh, microchip uh, sniffer that I showed you in the previous video. I'll throw a link up in the corner for that one. Uh, just because it's a little bit more robust, it's a little easier to dive into. This one, you have to write specific firmware and software to it to use it as a uh, analyzer. And so you can't use it as an analyzer at the same time that you're using, uh, using it as a CAN device on the network. But in this case, we were looking for commands from that push button switch. So I went ahead and pulled a log file. And this log file is, is from probably about 10 seconds of operation, if that. If we look at, we're at 22.5. We go down to the very bottom of this thing, 26, 27. So, yeah, five seconds of operation. And through trial and error previously, I'd already determined that the hex address for the switch, and it's not even necessarily a switch, but the BCM uh, command address is uh, 380. And that is whenever the switch, uh, the BCM reads a different resistance from the switch and it does the calculation as I talked about earlier on what state it is and it determines the output of the switch it should be, this is the command that it sends out. Now, what we're looking at over here is the data. And if we break down the data, the uh, first four data uh, portions are going to be ex the actual command. Uh, the OX78 and OX04, which is uh, going to be what? One, two, three, four. Data five and six, those never change. And then the data seven and eight in this situation is a watchdog. So we're not concerned about the watchdog portion of it because that part's always cycling whenever we're scanning. So if we go in and do a trace log and watch specifically on this address, the 380 uh, number eight, we will see those last two data points cycling constantly, you know, between zero and 255 on uh, as a decimal. So the, as I said, the main thing that we're looking for is the changes in states in the first four data points. Now, if we were to scroll through here and find all the 380s, we're gonna find that whenever we went from off to on is one change, and then whenever we're running is a different change, and then whenever we go from on to off based on whether or not the car is running is a different change. So let's jump over and I'll show you what I did in the software itself. So here is the program that I wrote specific to monitoring the switch. I've got this thing underneath the dash, literally double-sided tape to the BCM, and it is wired in uh, parallel right on the CAN bus, I'll show you here in a bit, uh, on the BCM itself. So what we have to do is first we have to set up our CAN mode. Well, the GM CAN bus mode in this situation is a 500K uh, CAN mo mode, so that's the rate that it is talking. And then we are uh, going to go ahead and set up our I.O. channel. In this case, we are using I.O. channel 8 to control our relay. And that relay is wired, normally closed, to complete that circuit. Whenever we energize channel 8, it opens that relay up. That kills the circuit to the ignition relay, which then shuts down power to the ECMs. Next, we want to put in is our CAN receive identity and it is that 380 that we talked about. So this is our first qualifier. We need to make sure that the message we're looking for starts with that 380. That's what filters out all the other traffic that we could be seeing on the CAN bus. Then we come in here and we have to say, not only is it 380, but we actually need new data to come in at 380. Because if we just had CAN data received, if anything else had the same data bits in data zero through uh, three or whatever, we could have issues with that data being replicated for a different command out there that's sending it. The chances of that happening are pretty slim. I will admit it, but this just makes the life a little bit easier to make sure that we are filtering that the data that we received at that moment is only directly from that CAN address. So this is where the meat and potatoes comes into it. We've got multiple equal to statements and or statements. We're going to start because as you can see right here that the top two are from the same two data spots, data zero and data one. And if you go in and look, you'll notice that it is data one is first in there and then data zero is second. That's gonna be most significant by first in this situation. Uh, so whenever we go in here and these are constants that we're doing, we need to make sure and put data one first, then data zero. In this case, they're both 11, so it comes out as 11, 11. But on this one, it's 12. The zero, 00 has to go in there, or it automatically populates the zero, 00 because 12 is data 0, data 1 is uh, zero, 00. If we were to go back and look at our log file, 
that would be something akin to having, let's see here, this right here where we had FF is data 2 and data 1 is 0, 0. So that being said, what do these different things mean? Well, in this case, this is one command from the switch and this is another command from the switch. We want to make sure that it is equal. The command that we are getting in whenever we receive data up here is equal to this in data 0 and data 1 or equal to this in data 0 and data 1. That's why we have this exclusive OR. It has to be either this uh, data format, this message, or this message. If it's anything else, this does not become true. And if this block right here is not true, then this block can't be true. Same as if this block's not true, then this block can't be true. So now that we know that this block up here, our logical AND, and our exclusive OR blocks are true, we can now go down to the next step of the logic. Same ordeal, we've got another AND block in this case, and we're looking at data 2 and data 3. Same ordeal, we've got two different states that data 2 and data 3 can be in. But if you were to go back and look at it, you'll notice that data, the first st states of data 0 and data 1 can only match the first states of data 2 and data 3. Same ordeal, the second states of data 0 and data 1 can only match the second states of data 2 and data 3. But we want to make sure that those are together correctly, and that's why we're using the exclusive OR. So it's going to look at that information again, determine that this is correct in that one, pass it on, and then we have two now logical X and Ys that is going to result in a 1 coming down to our final logical X and Y. This last one does not change regardless. So the top ones in here on data 1 and data 0, data 1, data 2, and data 3 are if the engine is off and you request an off status, but the ignition is on, it will still recognize that as an off status and it will break that circuit to the ECMs. The second ones on these blocks are if the ignition is on and the engine is running. Two different states that we have to monitor for, but on both states, data 4 and data 5 are always uh, 7804. Uh, so we can leave that as the final qualifier. Now we have six data points that we're looking for to verify that this message is the correct message. And as I said, from the get-go, we are verifying that the message is coming from that 380 address. Once all of that comes out to be true, we now have an output, but we want to delay off. And that means that we will kick the output on, but we will hold it for 10 seconds minimum. And that's because we want to make sure that the relay disconnects long enough because if it doesn't, the relay can actually chatter and come back in and keep everything powered up. It will, and I had that happen, that's why I had to put the delay off in there. And then finally, we are driving digital output 8 high in this situation, making it positive 12 volts to trigger our relay. Hopefully, I know this is a lot to digest. It was a lot of information, but it will give you some insight as to what we were thinking of whenever we wrote the program out here, how we filtered the message, broke the messages down. If we go back and look in here, you can see exactly the message that we were looking at. This is the section, as I said, that we're paying attention to. We're disregarding the FCEE. That is the uh, watchdog timer. We don't have to worry about the ID of 8. We only care about the 380. That is the message address, as it were. And then we are paying attention, as I said, particular to this string, this, these six data points in hex, and how we can verify and replicate. But for now, let's dive over into the car real quick, and I'll show you exactly where it's mounted, how everything's wired up. Pretty straightforward and simple. Okay, excuse the mess, uh, but you can see the module back up there where the Delphi sticker it is. It's double-sided taped on there, and then it is tapped into the CAN bus lines over here on the right. And then I've got just a fuse tap down here that's coming off the accessory fuse. The reason that we use the accessory fuse is because that circuit's energized for 10 minutes after we turn the car off. That makes sure that this thing will keep on working. Uh, because if you don't, if you were to tie it into ignition power, it would shut off and sometimes the ignition relay could come back on. And then the white cable that's going out there, the white wire, is the one that goes to our relay that is in line. There is an LED on the device. I don't have the LED program, so you could actually program that thing so you could see the status of the relay in, on top of it. Uh, but that being said, let me go ahead and start the car here.
And now that we've got the car started, I can hit the off button and it shuts her right on off. Now this isn't going to be the last time that we dive into the Canny 7. In fact, I've got another problem that I think is going to be the solution for that. And it is that we are getting the reduced power mode display on the DIC. And most likely it's tied back to the fact that the ECM can no longer see both the throttle body and the accelerator pedal. But in order to solve that, we don't need to really do anything other than output the voltages, which we can do through the Canny device. We can do one to five outs on those or zero to five volt outs on those and send one that represents the low throttle position sensor and the other one that represents, uh, represents the high. And then we can also do a voltage signal for the pedal position. So as far as the ECM is considered, it's gonna get those values. They're just not gonna ever change, but that should be enough at least to clear up the issue where it tries to say that we're in low power mode, even though we're not because we're on a standalone ECU. Then on top of it, there's some other things that we may wanna end up triggering off of CAN messages like we did this relay. That's the cool thing about this is we can go in dig in and double check things, but be careful because you can uh, get message talk over, you can have some addressing issue, things like that. Make sure and do your due diligence, test everything out. I will post links down below to all of this equipment that I've used, uh, and of course the software is free to download, so I suggest you go out there, play with it. It can be a little bit hard to learn at the beginning.